Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us for a conversation, uh, an important conversation about election security and voting during the coronavirus pandemic. I am so delighted to be joined today by two experts, uh, the chair of the Illinois Board of Elections, Chuck Schultz, um, and the vice chair of the Illinois Bull Board of Elections, Ian Linneberry, to share their expertise and answer all of our questions. So um, we know that some folks throughout the 14th submitted some questions in advance, and so we're going to get to those questions later on in our conversation. Um, and, you know, we just know how dramatically COVID-19 has impacted all of our lives, from how we work, to how we learn and play, to how we celebrate holidays, and even going on vacation. And so voting is no exception. Voting is the most essential piece in our democracy. And people like my friend, uh, the great Congressman John Lewis, fought for this right. Folks have marched, they've shouted, and put their lives on the line for this basic right. And it's a serious responsibility. And it's an incredibly special one. So this year, we're presented with a few new challenges to voting, the coronavirus. And in order to ease some of our fears around voting in a time of a pandemic, I wanted to provide an opportunity for us to get answers straight from the source. So I want everyone watching this video to know that um, our goal is to make sure that you understand your voting options and what you can do right now today to ensure that you can vote in November's election. I also wanna share what our colleagues have been doing in Congress to ensure safe and fair elections this fall. So back in March, I was proud to support the CARES Act, which provided $400 million in election security grants to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus um, for the 2020 federal election cycle. Now this critical funding thankfully was signed into law, but it's just the beginning. And that $400 million alone is not enough. To further keep Illinoisans safe, I supported the HEROES Act, which passed the House in May. And that legislation would provide an additional $3.6 billion for the equipment, the supplies, and staffing needed to the administer the elections in 2020 in a manner that protects voters and poll workers' health. We got to that number by consulting with the experts. You all may remember, we had a field hearing in our district last fall, and some experts told us at that time we would need $2 billion to secure our elections. Well, they updated those estimates based on the coronavirus, and that's how we got to the $4 billion number. 3.6 billion in HEROES, 400 million in the CARES Act, and we are committed to delivering those resources to ensure that everyone can cast their vote safely and securely this fall. I also strongly support the $25 billion in funding for the United States Postal Service included in the HEROES Act. Now we know that with the increase in mail ballots, the Postal Service needs the additional funds to maintain levels of service and to mitigate delays. I am horrified by the recent changes in structure and operations over at the post office. And so we've heard from so many of you who depend on the Postal Service for your prescription drugs, who live in rural communities and only receive deliveries from USPS, and many of you who are concerned heading to the polls this fall. So we look forward to getting back to Washington this week to fulfill my constitutional rep, uh, responsibility to protect this critical piece of our democracy because we know how important voting is. And so today, again, we've invited these two special guests our State Board of Elections leaders to share how we can all prepare to vote safely this fall. Chair Schultz and Vice Chair Linneberry, thank you again. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and first, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Schultz to share some opening remarks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Representative Underwood, and we appreciate your invitation to participate. I thought maybe I would start and explain what we are as the State Board of Elections. We're an Fabulous. independent agency created under the Illinois Constitution. We're bipartisan. So we have eight members, four Democrats, four Republicans, four from Chicago area, four from out state. And we work very well collaboratively. Uh, generally speaking, uh, our votes are unanimous. And of course, we have a big challenge this year. We have two different uh, programs we're trying to get implemented through the Board of Elections, but it all goes down to the 102 county clerks out there and the other six uh, separate election authorities. So we have eight, 108 election authorities that we are, uh, thanks to the funding we got from 
uh, the federal government, Congressman, we are the conduit. So uh, some of that money is going to facilitate vote by mail, which of course we feel is the safest way to vote. We don't want anyone to risk their health to vote. Uh, and so that's being tremendously expanded on this one time only statute. And we also are dealing with cybersecurity. So what I thought I'd do is let Vice Chairman Lineberry explain what's different about vote by mail and all the volume. And then uh, if we have an opportunity, I'd like to talk about what we're doing for cybersecurity as well, which is also money we received from the federal government we're grateful for. Uh, uh, Ian, you want to talk about vote by mail? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, first, Congresswoman Underwood, thank you very much for inviting us to be here. It's my distinct honor to be here alongside my, my colleague, um, Chairman Scholz. Uh, as he noted, we are, we're a bipartisan board. There are four Republicans, four Democrats. So by virtue of that composition, it takes a bipartisan vote to accomplish anything. And as Chuck, as Chuck noted, the vast majority of our votes are unanimous. And, and that's the way we try to operate. Our staff is nonpartisan and we are solely interested in ensuring the safety and security of elections. And this year, that, that need, is, as you both have noted, that, that entire dynamic construct of voting has changed significantly due to COVID-19. So on a one-time only basis, the Illinois General Assembly has passed a law that deals primarily with expansion of mail-in voting um, with the ability to, to vote by mail. Now, in Illinois, voters have had the right to vote by mail for decades. Um, I remember when I was a young man and I first uh, became entitled to vote after turning 18. Uh, I, I don't think it was on the 18th, my 18th year, but the next year I had to vote absentee, which is a form of mail-in voting. Although at that time you had to provide a basis. So you had to sort of substantiate your need to vote by mail. Well, no longer. Now anyone can vote by mail. Um, and as Chuck noted, it's really the safest way to vote this election. So. Uh, early voting starts September 24th and uh, runs all the way through the day before the election. And the, the state of Illinois has mandated that if you voted in any of the last three elections, that you will automatically receive a, an application for a mail-in ballot. So you don't receive directly a ballot. What you receive is an application that you fill out, sign, and send back to your election authority. And in return, the election authority will send you a ballot, which you complete. And you have, you have a couple of options, really you have three options once you get that ballot. You can either fill it out carefully, sign it, place it back in the envelope, seal it, and place it in the, in the mail for the US Postal Service to deliver to your election authority. Or in some instances, local election jurisdictions have established secure drop boxes where you can physically deposit your completed mail-in ballot within the envelope in the box. And those boxes are carefully monitored and secured and emptied every evening by the election authorities. And then finally, uh, if your jurisdiction doesn't have a drop box and you don't feel confident uh, placing your ballot in the mail, you can always drop it off with your local election authority. Um, and you have the right to do that anytime during that early voting process. So this, we anticipate on this basis that the number of people voting by mail will substantially increase. You know, in our last presidential election, 2016, on a national level, uh, approximately 33 million ballots were cast by mail across the country. That represents about 24% of the total 100 and I think it was 140 million ballots that were cast nationwide. So that's a significant number. And we have every reason to expect that it will at least double during this election cycle. So, uh, but we're looking forward to the changes, you know, and, and, and just before I wrap up and, and turn it back over to you, Congresswoman, you also have two other options during that early voting period to, to, to vote early and avoid the lines and potential congestion on election day. You can vote in person early at your election authority, or some election jurisdictions will also offer curbside voting, where you can drive to your election jurisdiction and you can vote within the comfort of your own car without even getting out. So those are options. I encourage everyone who's interested in exploring those options to check with your local election jurisdiction, your local election authority. As Chuck said, there are 106 county clerks, I'm sorry, 102 county clerks plus six election jurisdictions separate from the county clerks, making 108 election authorities within the state. Um, you need to know which election jurisdiction has authority over your voting rights and contact them to be sure you're getting the most accurate and update information.
Okay, so just to summarize, because you gave us a lot in yeah. that <laughs> short introduction, Mr. Linneberry. So uh, folks who voted in the last three elections will be sent from their election authority a application to vote by mail. So if you're not sure who that person is and you got something in the mail already, that's the person that they could call with questions. Yes, and they and that, probably have got it already. Yes. For instance, I'm pretty sure in DuPage County, they're all out. Yes, so we have the great joy of representing seven counties here in Northern Illinois. So okay. we try, we're with you in talking about election okay. authorities because it's different county by county. Right. Um, but uh, everybody who voted in the last three elections should have received it from that election authority. If you didn't receive something in the mail and you voted at your current, using your current address, right, in the previous election, then they can go onto the website or reach out to that local election authority and request a ballot. Isn't that true? That's right. correct. Okay, so you don't have to just passively receive one. Every, everyone has the option, registered voters have the option of requesting their ballot by mail as well. Absolutely, and uh, there will be people that haven't voted in the last three years that want to vote or That's right. new voters. So uh, absolutely, all they have to do is contact the uh, local election authority and they'll be sent an application. Then that signed application will produce the ballot. There's a lot of security involved here. With that ballot then has to be signed. And when it's received by the election authority, the signature with that ballot will be compared to the signature on file with the voter registration. Just like you do when you walk into the precinct to vote that day, you sign. So uh, uh, bipartisan, we'll have Democrat, Republican judges review all of those as they come in. We can't count any votes till seven o'clock on November 3rd but the clerks can begin the processing and, and get them ready to be counted. Because one thing people have to be aware of is, you know, not all the votes are gonna get counted election night. In Illinois, if you, you can vote, and you know, some people wanna wait till election day to make up their mind. So they can vote by mail on November 3rd, if it's postmarked November 3rd, and if it's received by the election authority within 14 days, their vote will still count. As Ian said, our hope is that the vast majority of people will take advantage of vote by mail or go to an early voting center that won't be crowded. Uh, obviously, we're uh, part of our money goes in addition to postage and uh, printing. All the janitorial and, and supplies that we're going to need to keep everything uh, safe in these polling places. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, Congressman, okay. is that we're closing schools on November 3rd. Uh, for two reasons. One is those are good polling places. You know, we used to vote a lot in the nursing homes. We don't want people coming into a nursing home now, obviously. So uh, by closing schools, you, you have a place like a grade school gym that's accessible, that's big, that we can spread out and do social distancing, but there won't be any kids there. The other aspect of closing schools I'd like to get out in your congressional district is for recruitment of judges. We would love to have school teachers for election judges and students under this new act, you can be a judge if you're 16 years or older. Oh. And as you know, Congresswoman, currently our judges skew into an older demographic. That's right. That would be at a higher risk for COVID. So getting younger judges uh, would be a, a nice uh, aspect of closing the schools on election day. And that's a paid position. So it's yes. not only a civic role and contributing to your community, but you get paid for your time for serving as an election judge. I think that would be a great experience for a high school senior. Yeah. Yes, okay. So um, for those who are watching in the 14th Congressional, what we'll do is we will put a list of the local election authorities so that you can look at your county and just click the link so that if you have any questions, we make it easy for you. Um, and that's also where you can go to get more information on requesting ballot applications, where you can get more information on serving as an election judge. Is that right? Right. Okay. Perfect. So um, anything else on this vote by mail requesting a ballot topic? Yes, Mr. Linneberry. No, I'm sorry. I just have one thing that I, that I, an important point that I neglected to point out my first time that I think yes. is important for people to know. The, the election authorities are not the only sources of absentee ballot or vote by mail ballot applications. The, the statute that was passed by the General Assembly allows third parties to prepare 
ballot applications in, in substantially the same form as you might receive from an election authority. So that's a potential source of, of confusion for folks if maybe they receive more than one ballot application. Um, again, as you pointed out, they can call their election authority to verify the le legitimacy of the application that they've received. But by and large, those are going to be valid ballot applications that are simply prepared by independent third parties and sent to voters. So you may receive more than one ballot application in connection with this election, or you may receive none, you know, so you just, you need to be able to, you need to do your homework. Yes. And that homework can be done right now. Yes. So this is not something that folks have to wait to do. Like literally today when they're watching this video, they can log onto the site or call over to their county clerk in our community and, you know, verify their registration status. They can request a ballot if they want and you know make sure that anything that they received in the mail that they may fill out is accurate and valid and you know reputable sound good that is okay. such a great point congresswoman because if there's one thing we could emphasize it's start early yes if you already know how you're going to vote please vote early that will help your local election authorities it will help everybody so you're right to be starting right now Okay, so then Mr. Schultz, you said that you wanted to talk a little bit about cybersecurity and well, the 14th know how critically important cybersecurity is. We serve on the cyber subcommittee on the House Homeland Security Committee. So this is a very sophisticated, educated group. They've been hearing about this from me a lot. So please give us the update. Well, in July of 2016, uh, we discovered we had been hacked and uh, we were hacked by the Russians. In fact, uh, Robert Mueller has indicted some GRU colonel for hacking the Illinois State Board of Elections. I doubt, you know, if he'll be brought to justice. But anyway, we know what happened. And uh, some 70,000 voters had some of their voter file information compromised. However, as you know, Congressman, the first thing you do when you run for office in Illinois is get a copy of the voter file. It's not top secret, but it was a concern. We wrote letters to everybody who had their uh, information compromised. And of course, since then, we've taken many, many steps to secure our information. And a lot of that is, is uh, technical firewall stuff. But we have also, thanks again to uh, the uh, federal funding that we received, we have instigated a, uh, we call it the Cyber Navigator Program. It could be a model for the whole country, but we have nine very, uh, well-equipped cyber navigators that have done a risk assessment of all 108 election authorities. Wow. After the risk assessment, they came back to the Board of Elections and said, this is what we, we are recommending that we do in order to increase our security. Uh, and it's been a variety of things. Ian and I have uh, approved dozens of grants over, over the last year to to local counties, but typically the bit, one of the big things is uh, getting everyone on the on a one secure network, the Illinois Century Network, and we have a partnership with the state of Illinois and the Department of Innovation and Technology on this. But uh, we don't want anything on the internet. You know, people are afraid that some hacker from overseas could mess with their vote, and they have to remember uh, we don't deal with the internet you know if you go if you want to vote in person and everybody has a right to do that and they'll be able to do that on november 3rd you know you just go into the that little high school gym and you you darken your circles and, and it's read by a machine that is not connected to the internet it's counted there within the precinct by your friends and neighbors your five local election judges that is then posted on the door of the precinct and taken down to the courthouse then when it's when it's uh sent to us at State Board of Elections, it goes over this Illinois Century Network, which is a private, secure, state of, only, state of Illinois only network. So there's no internet involved where anyone can mess with any of the tabulation. Uh, so I just wanted to stress that. And uh, in addition, our own Illinois National Guard, the 13,000 men and women of the Illinois National Guard that help us, yeah, I've had them during the flood over here. I, I live on the Mississippi and Quincy. Uh, we actually have uh, 130 uh, cybersecurity experts that are men and women of the Guard, and they will be deployed on Election Day. Really? And, yes. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to cost us about $35,000. It's money well spent. And that way we could have boots on the ground in the smallest 
most out of the way courthouse in Illinois, if there is an issue uh, either leading up to the election or on election day, we can dispatch a cybersecurity expert and, and keep that straightened out. Because, you know, one of the fears is uh, smaller counties don't have an IT person. Right. They, uh, you know, some of these small clerks, it's just them and one or two assistants. So uh, if you're a hacker, you want to go for the weakest link. So we want to make sure all 108 election authorities are secure on November 3rd. And we feel really good about the progress we've made. That's incredible. Thank you for that update. So, you know, we're hearing that um, none of our in-person votes or uh, mailed in votes are going to be connected through the internet. It's a secure right. uh, chain of information that does not touch the internet. And we have the Illinois National Guard experts in cybersecurity um, standing by to help us at the local level if Correct. there are issues that arise during election season. Yes. Incredible. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lindeberry, did you want to add anything to that? You know, uh, just very quickly, Chuck, that was an excellent summary by Chuck. The one point that I'd add is that, um, as Chuck talked about during the, the initial part of his comments, he and I have approved over $2.5 million in small grants to the individual county organizations for them to bolster their their cybersecurity um, protocols and infrastructure in the counties. Um, and, and that's been a really effective program, uh, really well appreciated by the local counties, particularly the smaller counties that have, you know, they're a little bit more prone to falling behind the times um, as far as the technology is concerned. Yep, good, so that everybody is operating at the same level. Um, sure. That's great. Okay, so let's take it back to COVID and what voters should expect if they decide to vote in person. What kind of changes and flow or processes could folks expect on, on election day if they decide to vote on November 3rd in person? Well, if you vote uh, in person, is again, you have the right to do that. Uh, you're going to see hopefully a polling place where social distancing uh, is achieved. We're going to expect you to wear a mask and respect these election officials that are there uh, working that day to uh, conduct the election. Uh, so we'll have uh, the, all the disinfectant and, and uh, sanitizing supplies and so forth will be available in the in the precinct. And hopefully what they'll find, Congresswoman, is that uh, it's not going to be that crowded because we'll have the majority of the votes will already have been cast. Hopefully. Okay. Okay, so easy in, easy out, stay socially distanced, wear your, mask. Patient, wear your mask, and make sure to cast your ballot. Absolutely. Okay, so I know you touched on it earlier, um, but if you're a first time voter, you're um, planning to vote at home, what should those people do? Do they, they obviously need to take an affirmative step, right? This is not gonna be passive, like somebody's just gonna send them an application. So can you just walk that first time voter through uh, the actions that they will need to take to participate um, in the election this fall? Go ahead, Ian. Sure, so th that, that's a great question. Um, first time voters should, as, as a first step, they should call their election authority and verify that they are registered and the registered registration is in effect. Uh, once they've verified their registration, they need to decide how they would like to vote. Again, they have options. They can vote by mail, they can vote curbside, they can vote in person early or in person on election day. So if they decide they're gonna vote at home under this scenario, they, they are, they're gonna vote by mail. Um, they're gonna want to download and complete or request a ballot application. You can, some election jurisdictions will have that available to download on their website, which will make it very easy for a younger voter. Um, or they can request to have, them, have one mailed to them. And, and again, this is an opportunity for us to stress what, what all three of us have been talking about. Uh, please do this early. The earlier that, that voters start this process and get through the process, um, the, the, the better the entire process will work for everyone as we spread out the burden on the Postal Service and on the election authorities that will be imposed by the, the significant increase in the volume of mail-in ballots. So okay. once this person submits their application, they should expect that they'll receive a ballot in the mail from the election authority, and they need to carefully review the instructions, complete the ballot as specified, sign it, 
place it in the envelope, and I believe you sign the envelope, the outside of the envelope, and then you have options as to how you return your completed ballot. You can place it in the mail to be mailed back to the jurisdiction. And then, you know, if you've done this early and there's plenty of time, I don't think there's any reason that you should have any trepidation about placing your ballot in the mail. But if you do have concerns, then you could place it in a drop box to the extent your county or your election jurisdiction has provided secure drop boxes. If your election authority has not done that, then you can drop that ballot off at the office of your election authority, which is generally the county clerk or, you know, or, or a board of elections. Um, and, and one aspect of the, the, the law that people don't talk about very often is as a voter, you're not required to deposit your ballot in the mail or in a drop box or the election authority yourself. If, if you have a compromised immune system and you're really anxious about going out, you don't wanna mail it either, you can give that ballot to a trusted loved one or a caregiver and they can, they can drop that ballot off for you. Okay. That's really helpful information. Thank Good you. Point, so the House passed legislation in May to offer this $3.6 billion in funding to support state and local governments to adequately prepare for upcoming elections. Can you talk about why election assistance grants are helpful uh, to the Illinois Board of Elections and you know what that money is? Is useful to to different responses, but just, you know, you all received a certain amount of funding and, you know, what are you doing with it? <laughs> well, that's a good okay. question because we have received a lot of federal yeah. money and I think we've been very responsible stewards. Of but, course. Uh, everybody has a right to know how, how we divide it up and uh, Ian could get into more details, but generally speaking, of course, it was per capita based on registered voters uh, in each county. But as Ian also pointed out, some counties had more challenges than others and you know did not have the resources themselves the the reason the federal funding has been so crucial is without it it's up to each county yeah. and right. counties uh you know revenues are down and they're dealing with all the other economic effects of the pandemic and uh budgets are tight so this has allowed for a huge volume increase in what they normally uh would mail uh, and print. Printing, I would think, might be more expensive even than all the postage. Uh, so uh, it's been extremely helpful. And, you know, even after we get through this election, Congressman, we'll be back because, uh, in general, we need to upgrade uh, everything in the state of Illinois yeah. uh, as far as our election infrastructure. But we're really waiting for the Federal Election Assistance Commission to come up with the next uh, certified level of equipment that we can move to. And that'll probably happen pretty soon within the next year, I think. So anyway, but thank you so much for, for the federal assistance. Uh, we've done well with it. Ian, you want to add anything to that as to uh, each county had different needs. Uh, oftentimes, though, it was uh, hardware. Yeah, no, you, I thought your summary was excellent, Chuck. The only thing I'd add is the, the Board of Elections produces a quick guide that talks about the allocation of the grant money. And I'd be happy to share my screen. So just put that up there for you know a couple of seconds. And then if any of your viewers watching this want to do a, a screen grab afterwards, they'll have that information. Is that right, and, now, and, and it, on this current funding, uh, they, these individual election authorities will be applying to us to get reimbursed. So, so nobody's going to get money that they didn't use. They're going to have to demonstrate to us what their printing bill, postage bill, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important point. So can, can you all see the quick, quick reference guide? Yeah, I, yes. There you Very go. good. He's yeah. so talented technologically. And I here I am. I'm my kids. 20th century guy. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of kids, Congresswoman, younger voters, you know, in Illinois, it's easy to vote. We have now uh, automatic voter registration and that's same true. day voter registration. But I, I wouldn't recommend that a young voter show up. And, and in smaller counties, you have if it's same day, you have to go to the courthouse. Uh, I would do that on election day. You have a right to do that if you insist. But again, early, check with your election authority. You want to be registered. Uh, contact them and find out how you're best able to cast your vote. Uh, again, People are entitled to vote on election day, but we're really encouraging that, that we get as many votes in early as we can. Amazing. And then how much did we get? Do you know offhand? 
How much money? Uh, well, we, we, I think we got 13.3 million, but then okay. the state of Illinois matched that with uh, about uh, 3 million. So it's about 16 something. Uh, we, we had a 20% uh, match, I believe it was, that the, the General Assembly included in this year's budget. Incredible. Okay, so we have some constituent questions. We have a, a few minutes left, so I thought I would just um, go through some of those with you. So the first is from John S. from Lake in the Hills. And he said, this is kind of long, the HAVA guidelines require that the election authorities statewide provide similar levels of ballot access, but some election authorities are not supportive of expanding their voting infrastructure. Lake and Will counties are in the process of provisioning multiple permanent drop boxes to locate in large population centers, while McHenry County is only planning on locating one box at the location you would drop off your ballot anyway. Will there be oversight and public accountability for the way each of the jurisdictions chooses, uses or chooses not to use the funds available from the CARES Act and the Board of Election Grant for postage reimbursement? Well, it's a good question. And the answer is that it is up to the election authorities to conduct their election with the funding that we give them. So, you know, while we're watching it carefully and they're gonna have to submit uh, request for reimbursement for these various items. For instance, on drop boxes, that's going to be up to the county clerk. And uh, I was visiting with Ian earlier today. I've talked to three county clerks who initially said, I don't want to do drop boxes. They'd never done them before. They wondered about, you know, what, what was involved in that. But then the State Board of Elections received the letter from the Postal Service, which we distributed to all 108 election authorities, warning us about uh, inability to meet deadlines. And so they started getting calls from their constituents and all three of those clerks that I mentioned are now doing drop boxes. Now today, Congressman, we just found out and you probably know more about it than, than Ian and I do, but that uh, perhaps uh, the situation has improved with the Postal Service. So it, it, that may uh, have an impact on how the election authorities view the, the boxes. Uh, I know we're going to have one here in my home county of Adams County, and I'll probably put my ballot in there. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, hope, I hope they're readily available, but I, I think in some smaller counties, uh, they, may not, they may not do that. And when the, uh, your constituent asks for accountability, that would be with their county clerk or their election board if they live in one of those jurisdictions. So they have some autonomy in how they choose to spend yes. the funds in each election yeah. authority. And I think they're pretty responsive. If they're concerned about it and they called their county clerk, it probably would have some impact. Okay. Mr. Lineberry, anything else to add on that question, sir? No, no, I think that was a good response. Okay, so speaking of the Postal Service, we have a question from Megan H. who asks, what are we going to do to ensure that the United States Postal Service will not be allowed to delay or otherwise tamper with the mailing and collection of ballots? And so the Postal Service, we know, is going to create, play an absolutely critical role in this year's election. And they've been very clear that they need additional funding to deliver mail, including ballots without delay, which is why the HEROES Act included <laughs> $25 billion for revenue loss um, due to the coronavirus pandemic, plus an additional $15 million provided to the Postal Service Inspector General. And that individual is who has oversight over the use of those, those dollars. And so that legislation's already passed the House and we're hopeful the Senate will act soon. Additionally, I'm gonna be going to Washington to vote this Saturday on some legislation um, to ensure that further delays are not able to be taken into effect and to again reaffirm this $25 billion funding level would be made available to the Postal Service. And we're hopeful that the Senate will take up that legislation. Did you all have any comments about the Postal Service? Um, on top of whatever you well that's really more in your bailiwick but i okay. appreciate that you're dealing with it okay so then we have a question um uh, from steve w from naperville who wants to be an election judge again but he's 62 his family members are at risk and he's concerned with COVID 19. so he says literally how can you guarantee my safety so what what would you all say in response i i don't know that we can i do know that it, all of these uh, polling places will be uh, required to be in compliance with the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, standards. But, you know, who could say? I, I don't know, Ian, if you got a, anything you want to add? 
No, I, I just, I agree with you. I don't think any, I don't think there's anyone who can guarantee an individual's safety under any circumstances in light of the pandemic and the changing nature of what we understand about the virus. But um, I would say, I just echo what you said, all of these polling places will comply with Illinois Department of Public Health policies, which largely mirror CDC best practices. We're gonna be doing everything we can to ensure the safety of our election judges and voters. And, and that means, you know, basic things like social distancing, the wearing of masks, frequent hand washing, you know, avoiding touching common surfaces. Uh, the, there will be plenty of protocols in place to, to ensure people's safety. But if, if you're concerned about your safety or you're concerned about the safety of those people with whom you come into regular contact, um, perhaps being an election judge isn't the best decision for you. Not this year anyway. And, and uh, this is why we need younger judges. Yeah. You know, I, I'm in that age category and, and I would worry about going myself. So uh, if we can get some teachers, if we could get some students, uh, I think a student working with an experienced election judge would be fine. And as you pointed out, Congresswoman, they make a little money that day. That's right. Okay, so this is our last question. I know we're coming short on time. Um, but Sandra M. from Wakanda asked, how do you know if your mail-in ballot was received and that the vote was counted? You can check with your election jurisdiction. It's, okay. I, I would encourage everyone to follow up with their election jurisdiction to make sure that their ballot was received. And in some circumstances, they may receive an email uh, indicating yeah. that it's been received. Some jurisdictions are, are available, I understand, to track with a barcode or something, and you might even get a text when they receive it. But for a lot of us out here in rural Illinois, we just need to do what Ian said and check with our election authority. Well, They'll know when they got your ballot. Yes. Thank you all so much. I mean, this conversation has given me so much hope. And, you know, we've been knee deep in these election security issues, but I would never met either of you. I appreciate your willingness to come and join us for this conversation. You know, just because things are new does give people some anxiety from time to time. And when we talk about voting in our elections. We want to make sure that everybody has the information. I want to thank you both for your leadership and, you know, making sure that Illinois voters um, are well prepared uh, to participate in this election. You are such critical leaders in our democracy, and we're so grateful for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, well, for thank us you. Today. Thank, thank you for having us, and we appreciate your support of having a safe election. Thank you. And Thanks. continue to take good care of yourselves. Bye, everybody. Thank you.